Excuse my language here, but when I first saw this photo, it scared the absolute f out of me. I kind of just stumbled upon it one day when I was just killing time on the internet. And the more I learned about this photo, the more horrified I became. The photo shows a climber trapped high up on Mount Everest, frozen in place inside of a dark, shallow cave. And as if that's not disturbing enough, the story leading up to this photo being taken is one of the most chilling, frustrating, and controversial stories in Mount Everest history. The man in the photo was named David Sharp, and as his name began to circulate in media headlines, it was often accompanied by the words, quote, left to die. And the reason for this was because not one, not two, not even three, but rather an astonishing 40 climbers passed David Sharp as he was dying in that cave, and yet nobody was able to save him. Most of the climbers who passed him didn't even try. Before long, the first man to ever summit Mount Everest and perhaps the most famous mountaineer in history chimed in. Sir Edmund Hillary said, quote, I think the whole attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying. The people just want to get to the top. They don't give a damn for anybody else who may be in distress and it doesn't impress me at all that they leave someone lying under a rock to die. But was that really what happened here? Was this truly a case of greedy, selfish climbers refusing to help somebody because it might interfere with their summit ambitions? Was David Sharp truly left to die or were the circumstances surrounding the scene in this photo a lot more complicated than the critics in the media proclaimed? I'll attempt to answer all of these questions and more in today's video, which is the terrifying last ascent of David Sharp. So this is definitely gonna be one of the most complicated and honestly controversial stories that I've ever told on this channel. It's no secret that climbing Mount Everest is dangerous, but I think the details of this story will really put into perspective just how ruthless not only the mountain is, but also the process of climbing the mountain is. So, with that said, come with me to a trip to Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the entire world. If this is your first time watching the channel, then this trip is free, but if you're a repeat viewer, you must hit that subscribe button to cover admission, and you'll also be helping us get to our goal of 1 million subscribers. In May of 2004, David Sharp was fresh off a failed attempt at reaching the summit of Mount Everest. He had made it pretty damn high up on the mountain, but when he realized that his fingers were frostbitten, he wisely decided to turn around. After finally leaving the mountain, he wrote an email to a friend that said, quote, don't think I'll be back to the big E. And maybe he meant that when he wrote it in the moment, but there's also a good chance that he didn't. And I say that because David Sharp's 2004 Everest attempt had not been his first, and it would soon become clear, at least to his friends and family, that it would not be his last. That's right, David Sharp was gonna make yet another attempt at reaching the summit of Mount Everest, and unfortunately, this attempt would be his last. If you couldn't tell, the details of this story are about to get very disturbing. And so before we get there, just real quick, let's keep it a little bit more lighthearted for just another minute while I tell you about Drink Element. Now I'm no mountaineer like David Sharp was, but I am a hiker and backpacker. And anytime I'm hiking or just doing anything that causes me to sweat a lot for that matter, you won't catch me without Drink Element. Drink Element is the best electrolyte drink mix in the game. It's not even close. If you're doing anything that causes you to sweat, you need to be replacing those electrolytes with Drink Element. If you don't, you're gonna get fatigue, you're gonna cramp up. It's so important to replace those electrolytes. And what you really don't wanna do, by the way, is go to Walmart and just buy whatever crap you find on the shelves there because I guarantee it's gonna be full of sugar and full of other nonsense. Drink Element doesn't have any of that. No sugar, all it has is a great taste and the electrolytes that you need to stay safe and stay hydrated. And their flavors taste amazing, by the way. So what you need to do is go to drinkelement.com 
drinklm.com slash kylehateshiking. That's drinklmnt.com slash kylehateshiking. Place an order through that link. And when you do so, you're going to get a sample pack of eight of their flavors thrown in with your order for no extra cost. And this is really, really important, by the way, because another great thing about Element is how they just have the craziest, best tasting flavors. Citrus salt is probably my favorite, followed by grapefruit salt, but orange salt's amazing. Like, they're also amazing. You really want to try them all. And so one more time, drinklmnt.com slash kylehateshiking. Go get, I don't know, citrus salt, and then you'll get that sample pack and you can try the rest of the flavors as well. I love them. Drinklmnt.com slash kylehateshiking. And let's get back to the story. David Sharp was born in Harpenden, England in 1972. He was known as a bright student during his early years, and this would eventually lead him to earn a degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Nottingham. His time in university would prove to be very formative. Not only did it start the launch of his career, but it's also where he joined the Mountaineering Club and honed in his skills and his love for climbing. After college, David Sharp got a job working in the defense industry and he continued to pursue mountaineering at the same time. He summited the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps, Mount Elbrus, the tallest peak in Europe, Kilimanjaro in Africa, and eventually he set his eyes on Gasher Broom 2, which is the 13th highest mountain in the world located on the border of China and Pakistan. Sharp joined an expedition to attempt the summit, but in what would become an unfortunate theme of Sharp's climbing career, he didn't quite make it due to bad weather. The leader of this first expedition described Sharp as, quote, socially not particularly adept, very much a loner. And he also said, quote, he wasn't a tremendously safe climber and he wasn't good at decisions. But with that said, on his next expedition in 2002, Sharp would earn a much better reputation when he successfully reached the summit of Cho Oyu, which is the sixth highest mountain in the world. Sharp did this as a part of an expedition with teams from New Zealand and Northern Ireland. And this time around, he was described as, quote, likable, friendly, and intelligent. His climbing was so impressive on this expedition that one of the leaders actually asked him to join a team that was planning on taking on Mount Everest the following year. And while I'm sure David Sharp was flattered by this invitation, the circumstances surrounding it were not exactly cause for celebration. While the expedition leaders certainly felt that David Sharp was qualified for Everest, the true reason that he had been invited on the expedition in the first place was because during the successful summit of Cho Oyu, one of the expedition's team members had died after falling into a crevasse. Because of this, David Sharp was invited to take this man's place on the next expedition. And I also think this is significant because Sharp would have been there when this man died. And so if he hadn't already understood the risks associated with mountaineering, he now certainly did. And thus, in April of 2003, Sharp and the rest of the expedition arrived at the base of Mount Everest. They waited for several weeks training and acclimating before finally making a push for the summit on May 22nd, 2003 via the North Route. Sharp was climbing with expedition leader Richard Duggan, or Dogan, I'm not exactly sure, when the two of them entered what is known as the death zone. The death zone is any altitude above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters where there is insufficient oxygen for humans to survive for long periods of time. After entering the death zone, Sharp and his partner continued to climb and they eventually encountered a very disturbing sight. They stumbled upon a shallow, dark cave that was well known among Everest climbers and not for any good reason. Inside this cave laid the body of a deceased climber known as Green Boots who had died in 1996. His body and the cave had become somewhat of a landmark on the route up Mount Everest and it served as yet another reminder to Sharp about the danger of what he was undertaking. Sharp's climbing partner reportedly said, quote, he, referring to green boots, looks like he's sleeping, to which Sharp then nodded in agreement. Nobody could have known it at the time, obviously, but that cave, that very same spot, 
would go on to become very significant to Sharp's story just a few years later and, once again, for all the wrong reasons. The men continued on from the cave, but just below an obstacle known as the second step, Sharp realized that he was suffering from frostbite on his toes. At this point, they were so close to the summit, but they still made the safe and respectable call to turn around. And then on the way down, they encountered a Spanish climber who was pretty banged up. He was in real bad shape, and so Sharp and his partner provided this climber with oxygen and assisted him until his condition improved. And the reason that I point this out is because this was yet another example to Sharp of Mount Everest's danger. But with that said, perhaps the most painful and costly example of this danger became clear after David Sharp had returned to base camp. The frostbite on his toes was bad. It was so bad, in fact, that he would end up losing most of his big toe on his left foot and a part of another toe on his right foot. But despite this harm that Everest did to his body, David Sharp was determined to make another push for the summit. Despite his failure to make it, he had apparently climbed pretty well, and he almost certainly would have made it to the top if not for the frostbite. And thus, in the spring of 2004, the next year, David Sharp was back at Everest Base Camp, this time joining a team of French and Austrian climbers. It's unclear to me exactly what Sharp's plans were, but it's reported that there was actually some tension between him and the group's leader due to a few of Sharp's seemingly new beliefs regarding Everest, ones that he hadn't really expressed the previous year. This time around, David Sharp wanted to attempt the mountain solo, and he also wanted to do it without the use of supplemental oxygen. Though it certainly has been done before, climbing at high altitude without oxygen tanks is incredibly difficult and dangerous. And yet despite this, it appears that David Sharp adopted a somewhat purist view of mountaineering, viewing the use of supplemental oxygen as almost cheating. He wrote in an email to a friend, quote, I'm one of those nutters who don't really approve of the use of oxygen equipment. My philosophy is that if you want more oxygen, climb a lower mountain. It's unclear to me if Sharp brought any oxygen on his 2004 attempt, but it does seem as though he changed his mind about going solo, at least for the moment. He ended up setting out with a few other members from the expedition, but he quickly fell behind and once again, he became frostbitten, this time on his fingers. At this point, he was well into the death zone for the second year in a row, but he didn't quite make it as far as he had the year earlier. He ended up turning around just below a spot known as the first step, despite the fact that the rest of the group that he started with successfully reached the summit, or at least that's my understanding. After he had returned from yet another failed attempt at Mount Everest, Sharp sent the email that I mentioned at the beginning of the story saying that he would not be attempting Everest again. However, this lack of desire would not last long or, according to some sources, last at all. In 2005, David Sharp took a course in education and then he spent some time backpacking through South America and Asia. He didn't make an attempt at Everest in 2005, but it does seem as though by the end of the year, he had made up his mind about going back to Everest the following year. 2006 was gonna be the year that David Sharp would make his final attempt at Mount Everest. And so just before Christmas in 2005, he sent an email to a friend who was on one of his previous failed Everest expeditions. And he said, quote, I'm stupidly contemplating a final, final attempt of Everest. Given the sequence of events that happened next in this story, I think this email would go on to become just incredibly disturbing. In the spring of 2006, David Sharp arrived at Everest Base Camp for the third time in the past four years. This time around, he intended on making good on his desire of ascending the mountain solo. Rather than joining with a traditional expedition team like he had done for all of his previous attempts, Sharp opted to do things mostly by himself. He did end up paying between six and seven thousand dollars to a company called Asian Trekking, 
which in return provided him with his permit, travel arrangements, food, oxygen, and transport to advanced base camp. But once Sharp traveled beyond advanced base camp, he was completely on his own. He had no Sherpas to carry his gear, he had no team to work together with, and he had nobody to guide or assist him. Apparently, he did have plenty of money in the bank to hire Sherpas or to join another expedition. In fact, he was actually asked by a friend specifically to join that expedition instead of going solo, but for whatever reason, he declined. David Sharp was determined to summit Mount Everest solo, and the only thing that was gonna stop him was Mother Nature herself. In the weeks leading up to Sharp's third summit attempt, he found himself in a bit of a moral dilemma. Just like he had done in 2004, he was once again wrestling with the concept of carrying oxygen tanks with him on his climb. He knew that it would obviously be safer to do so and that it would make it much more likely that he would reach the summit. But at the same time, he truly felt that a summit of Mount Everest without oxygen, without that support, was the ultimate goal. And so in the end, he ended up compromising. He purchased two cylinders of oxygen, but he reportedly was only planning on using them if he found himself in a dire situation or an emergency. After weeks of preparation, training, and acclimating, Sharp made a run for the summit. His first push saw him almost getting into the death zone before bad weather ended up driving him back. He told nobody when he left, or when he was planning on returning. In addition to that, David Sharp was not carrying a radio or a satellite phone. My understanding is that this is pretty uncommon. He had no way to communicate with anybody from the mountain and no way to call for help if he needed it. By the evening of May 13th, Sharp had made it well into the death zone where he was spotted at the highest camp on Mount Everest. Around 11.30 p.m., he began the last leg of his ascent. David Sharp wasn't spotted again until a few hours later, sometime between 1 and 2 a.m. on the 14th. At this point, he was passed by a group led by American Bill Kraus on a traverse known as the Exit Cracks. Sharp allegedly seemed tired as he was actually sitting off to the side of the worn path and he was disconnected from the fixed line. My understanding is that he was disconnected from the line so that the other climbers could just pass through without having to like disconnect and then reconnect on the other side of him. And so at this point he seemed tired, like I said, but given his actions here, it seems like he was still conscious and thinking clearly at least. Krause's group successfully reached the summit of Mount Everest and then on their descent they encountered Sharp again who was still ascending at this time by the way and the location of this encounter was the third step and it was now 11:20 in the morning. This time the group actually had to unclip and reclip to get around Sharp and Krause supposedly told Sharp to quote watch out. It's unclear to me if anything else was said between the two. Almost an hour and a half went by before Kraus looked back up the mountain and when he did this he noticed that Sharp, obviously now way off in the distance, had only moved about 300 feet. At this point it seemed like Sharp was the last person left that high up on the mountain. Exactly what happened next is unknown, although based on the timeline, it's likely that David Sharp reached the summit of Mount Everest around 2.30 to 3 p.m. on May 14th, 2006. Though this meant that he would have finally achieved this years-long goal, it came at an immense cost. Sharp would have almost certainly have depleted his supplemental oxygen supply at this point, and he would have been just completely exhausted after over 15 straight hours of climbing. It should be noted that there isn't any definitive proof that David Sharp reached the summit, and this is because his camera was never recovered, and tragically, he wouldn't live to tell the story himself. At some point during the afternoon of May 14th, whether it was after summiting or not, David Sharp turned around and he began slowly trudging back towards camp. And on his descent, he once again passed the infamous cave and the landmark 
of green boots. Unlike the previous times he had passed the cave, instead of just moving on past green boots, David Sharp joined green boots. Around midnight on May 15th, David Sharp was spotted in this cave by two Turkish climbers who were making an early push for the summit. Sharp was reportedly looking through his backpack or something like that, and apparently he kind of just waved off the Turkish climbers. Because of this, they thought that things were fine and that he was just taking a break. But shortly after this encounter, more Turkish climbers passed the cave and they came to a very different conclusion. They believed that David Sharp was not taking a break, but was rather dead. Laying there in the cave next to Green Boots, the climber who had become such an infamous landmark on the route up Mount Everest. But David Sharp was not dead. Around 1 a.m., one of the most controversial encounters of this entire story occurred when a film crew capturing Mark Inglis's summit attempt stumbled upon the cave. Inglis was attempting to be the first double amputee to conquer Mount Everest, and he was being guided by a man named Mark Woodward, along with several Sherpas. When the group shined their lights into the Green Boots cave, they were horrified to see David Sharp sitting there, curled up in the fetal position, severely frostbitten and barely breathing. The group yelled out to him to try and get him to move, and they even shined a light into his eyes. They got no response after doing this stuff. It seemed like Sharp was just down and out, and so they left him there, and they continued their ascent up through the death zone. Woodward was quoted saying, We pretty much considered that he was, if not dead, then not far off it. We all looked at him and realized he was pretty close to death and continued on. Hours went by, and David Sharp became more and more hypothermic and more and more frozen. And I, I mean not just cold, but literally frozen in place, by the way. Around 7 a.m., the Turkish climbers were coming back down the mountain, and now in the daylight, they were able to see a clear picture of how desperate Sharp's condition was. One of these climbers was quoted saying, we made him upright and tried to give him some hot drink, but he couldn't drink it. His nose was completely frozen deep inside. His hand was frozen as a rock. He was able to open his eyes, but couldn't say Say anything. This group of climbers were already in the midst of dealing with their own emergency because one of the members of their expedition was suffering from altitude sickness, and so their resources and their energy were already stretched way too thin. There was really nothing that they could do to help David Sharp, but they did make a few radio calls alerting others on the mountain of Sharp's condition. And after they did this, they left him there and they continued to descend. A few hours later yet, another climber encountered Sharp and this climber actually radioed down to base camp asking what he should do. The climber stated, quote, I established that David was still alive but unconscious and that his arms were frozen to the elbow and his legs were frozen to the knees and he had frostbite to the nose. This climber also stated that Sharp had apparently removed his gloves and opened his jacket which is behavior often exhibited by those suffering from severe hypothermia. This climber's expedition leader gave instructions over the radio to leave David Sharp and to continue descending. Now this and the actions of some of the previous climbers might sound harsh, but the reality is that the death zone is not a place where you can expend extra energy and resources beyond what you've planned for. When you're that high up, you're on borrowed time. You can only be there for a very limited time window. And unfortunately, you have to put yourself and your safety first in certain situations like this. This climber in particular was already low on oxygen himself. And so he reportedly began to cry as he descended away from David Sharp. But some climbers did in fact go out of their way to try and assist Sharp. Just before noon on May 15th, two climbers generously gave some of their oxygen to the dying man. Apparently Sharp was conscious enough to like mumble his name to these assisting climbers, but he was still unable to get up onto his feet. The climbers tried to help him up and help him walk, 
but this just proved to be too difficult. And so they moved him to a spot where he would at least be exposed to the sun. It was actually a spot where he laid directly over the route everybody was taking to descend. And then they unfortunately had to move on. After this, Mark Woodward's team once again encountered David Sharp. And once again, they concluded that he was beyond saving and simply continued on down the mountain. The next day, on May 16th, a Korean expedition encountered Sharp, and for the first time, they confirmed that he had died. They radioed this news back down to base camp, and eventually the news traveled far beyond Everest, and it appeared in headlines all over the world. Now, unfortunately, climbing accidents like this happen fairly consistently and most of them don't make international headlines. However, the reason that David Sharp's story did was because of the fact that so many people had passed him while he was dying and yet nobody was able to save him. Even more so, it seemed like nobody had even really tried. Investigations revealed that up to 40 climbers passed David Sharp on the mountain while he suffered and he froze to death, which is a number that sounds pretty horrifying, though I do want to note that my understanding at least is that most of these climbers either didn't see him or they thought that he was green boots or they thought that he was already dead. This didn't stop the media buzz, however. Journalists and commenters said that he was, quote, left for dead, and it didn't take long before one of the most famous mountaineers in history chimed in on the story. In 1953, Sir Edmund Hillary reached the summit of Mount Everest for the very first time in history, along with Sherpa Tenzing Norgay. Apologies if I got that name wrong. Now, by 2006, Hillary was in his late 80s, but he was still tapped into the world of mountaineering, and he had this to say about the controversy surrounding David Sharp's death. All I can say is that in our expedition, there was never any likelihood whatsoever if one member of the party was incapacitated that we would just leave him to die. I think the whole attitude towards climbing Mount Everest has become rather horrifying. The people just want to get to the top. They don't give a damn for anybody else who may be in distress and it doesn't impress me at all that they leave someone lying under a rock to die. These statements from such an iconic and well-respected mountaineer only added fuel to the fire. Mark Inglis and Mark Woodward were targeted for much of the criticism surrounding the events, but not everybody agreed that Sharp had really been, quote, left for dead. In fact, Sharp's own mother made it perfectly clear that she did not blame anybody for not rescuing Sharp. She said, quote, your only responsibility is to save yourself, not to try to save anyone else. And this brings us to a major ethical dilemma, one that people have been divided over for years and will undoubtedly continue to debate probably forever. Now, I'm a backpacker, I'm not a mountaineer, and so my opinion is pretty worthless when it comes to all this stuff, but it is my video, and so I will say that it seems like a lot of the criticism towards those who passed David Sharp in May of 2006 has kind of softened over the years. And I think there are two main reasons for this. First of all, the idea that Sharp was just left for dead and that nobody tried to help him is just not true. I mean, clearly given the story that I've told. Multiple different climbers stopped to call out to him. Some tried to give him oxygen and help him to his feet. And multiple radio calls were made about his condition. It's true that like a full scale rescue attempt was never made, but that never happened because of the second thing I want to highlight here. By all accounts, David Sharp was just too far gone to save by the time that people had encountered him. I mean, sure, I guess rescue could have been attempted, but multiple different experienced and accomplished mountaineering experts that passed David Sharp that day all determined that a rescue mission would have been just reckless. It would have put many other lives in danger, and let's also not forget that it wouldn't even have guaranteed Sharp's survival. Conditions in the death zone are so harsh and dangerous that bodies most of the time aren't even removed because it's just too difficult. David Sharp would have been well aware of all of the dangers 
of climbing Mount Everest. I mean, like I said earlier, multiple times, he had already experienced frostbite and seen dead climbers and helped assist other climbers who were in bad shape. He was aware of all of these things and it's certainly sad and awful that he died and I wish, I wish that he didn't. I think we all can agree on that. But at the end of the day, he took on the risk and unfortunately, tragically, he paid the ultimate price for it. My understanding is that David Sharp's body remained in the cave for about a year before it was finally moved somewhere else and buried, yeah, somewhere else on the mountain where it apparently remains to this day. It's a disturbing and controversial story, the ethics of which are still debated to this day. My heart goes out to David Sharp and all of his friends and family, and may he rest in peace. Thank you so much for watching.